Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, everybody, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming to the weekly physics colloquium. Uh, we have a special guest today who hails from University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom all the way to Astana to talk to us today about exoplanets. His name is Dr. Roman Rafikov, and it's a pleasure to have him. So let's give him uh, a warm welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds like uh, you know, a Nobel Prize for Barack Obama before he even <laughs> did anything good for the world. <laughs> Okay, good. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, yes, as the title uh, says, I will be talking about uh, uh, exoplanets today, and here is a brief, uh, brief uh, outline of my talk. So uh, my goal is uh, to provide a very broad overview of the field and not focus uh, very deeply on um, uh, one particular narrow aspect of it. Uh, so I hope to tell you about uh, different methods by which we learn about uh, exoplanets. Uh, then uh, describe to you what we have learned by applying these methods in practice, basically uh, what do we know now about the properties of exoplanets. And then uh, I will uh, very briefly uh, talk about planet formation, uh, focusing predominantly on uh, the properties and ways of studying the protoplanetary disks. Uh, and ultimately uh, I will uh, talk about uh, future challenges and um, future projects. Uh, uh, that hopefully will illuminate uh, the bright future of this uh, field for uh, many of you. So as I promised, I will uh, start with uh, observations. Um, and uh, the observations, uh, you know, it's uh, inescapable that I will have to say something about the planets in the solar system. Because after all, these are planets. Uh, in the solar system, we have uh, now eight uh, major planets, a whole bunch of minor planets, including Pluto. Um, potentially, you know, there, there is a distant planet X that we are uh, currently very actively searching for, but haven't uh, found it uh, yet. Uh, but there is a good evidence that it might be there. Uh, so the planets that we have in our own solar system can be loosely grouped into f uh, three uh, main uh, categories. So on the inside, close to the Sun, uh, we have Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth and Mars. Mars. And these are basically the rocky, uh, you know, uh, rocky uh, balls, uh, effectively with uh, iron cores of, uh, diff in different uh, proportions. So this is effectively big, uh, big uh, silicate cores with some addition of uh, iron predominantly. Now in the middle we have uh, gas giants, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, planets which have masses. Jupiter is 300 times more massive than the Earth. Uh, uh, Saturn is about 90 times more massive than the Earth. And these planets um, uh, have a vast, uh, uh, vast uh, gaseous envelopes uh, on tops of them. You can call them atmospheres, you can call them envelopes. We just know that uh, uh, there are cores in the centers of these planets. And these cores, in principle, resemble uh, the enhanced versions uh, of the Earth. Uh, so, for example, in the case of Saturn, we know that it contains a core uh, with a mass of at least 10 Earth masses and uh, maybe up to 20 Earth masses in its center. And then on top of that, there is uh, 70 or 80 Earth masses of uh, just uh, hydrogen, helium and other uh, gases uh, above it. Uh, in the case of Jupiter, things are not so obvious because Jupiter has a, a much stronger gravity, much higher density field in its uh, uh, center. And because of that, its equation of state is not so well known so that we right now are not yet capable of constraining the core mass in the center of Jupiter. But we believe that it uh, should be there. Uh, yeah. uh, I've, I've recently heard that, that they made solid <laughs> hydrogen in the lab. It, and is it true that... Jupiter has a solid it probably uh, it probably it definitely should have a uh, liquid metallic hydrogen uh, okay, so yeah so liquid metallic hydrogen because uh, the, I mean things depend also on the entropy of uh, the material that you have and the uh, interiors of uh, uh, Jupiter are hot enough that it might not be uh, in a solid state it might not be solid. yeah yeah you mentioned this uh, famous planet, planet X. yes Yeah, it's uh, far away. It's uh, right now. It should be at a separation of five uh, to six hundred astronomical units. An astronomical unit is just the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So this is far, far outside of uh, the you know orbit of Pluto, which is forty. Okay, what are the signatures? That uh, we, up to now, we know that there's something yeah. lurking there. 
yes, yes. So the signature, the main signature that we have right now is uh, that the Kuiper Belt objects, basically, you know, big uh, bodies like Pluto uh, sitting in outer solar system, have a very uh, strange arrangement of their orbits. Uh, they basically all seem to be aligned in one particular way. Uh, and one way to do, accomplish this is by having a very massive body with a mass of about 10 uh, Earth masses uh, sitting at a distance of about 500 to use. Uh, raw or yeah, it's oh no no no! It's totally it's totally like uh, how uh, Neptune was discovered by watching the perturbations on the orbit of Uranus. Yeah, so, but this is the the prediction. I mean, it hasn't been discovered by uh, you know directly getting uh, light from it. Yes. So uh, finally, in the outer uh, reaches of the solar system, we have Uranus and Neptune, which you know I already sort of partly mentioned. Uh, these guys uh, are something intermediate between uh, the terrestrial planets and gas giants. They do have. They do have substantial amounts of gas, uh, probably two to three Earth masses of uh, helium hydrogen and other gases, on top of pretty massive cores. Again, you know, they have cores uh, comparable uh, to the 10 uh, Earth uh, masses, uh, each of them. Uh, and, um, you know, just covered by this uh, thick atmosphere. So if you look at this as a, you know, global picture, you see that all of these, uh, all of these uh, planets in the solar system can be uh, considered as a course of some kind with no atmosphere, very big atmosphere, or, you know, something uh, uh, in between. So that's uh, kind of a picture of the uh, solar system. And let's see how uh, the exoplanets actually uh, put uh, our solar system in context. So first, exoplanet discoveries uh, happened uh, in the beginning of 1990s, and they were uh, actually a pretty strange kind of uh, planetary system, I have to tell you. Uh, that's because the first discovery of exoplanets happened around, not around a normal star, but around the neutron star. Neutron star is an object that uh, Yernazar, for example, studies uh, in his uh, simulations of uh, core collapse supernovae. These are basically the end product of the stellar evolution uh, that result from explosions of the core collapse uh, supernova. And they represent an object with a mass of about 1.4 uh, solar masses, which is extremely compact. It has a size of uh, probably slightly bigger than Astana, uh, 10 kilometers in, uh, in radius. Uh, and by uh, watching, uh, what, what's important about these uh, uh, neutron stars is uh, very often they have strong magnetic fields uh, and that allows them to emit light as so-called pulsars in a radio band. Uh, and uh, they spin with enormous uh, regularity so that they can uh, actually rival the accuracy with which uh, we can time them as clocks, uh, can rival the accuracy of atomic clocks uh, on Earth. And that property is uh, being used very heavily by, uh, for example, you know, observing these systems and trying to figure out if they are sitting in binary systems. Because if the, this uh, pulsar uh, is a, you know, a clock, uh, a very regular clock, uh, uh, and if it's in a binary system, then what you see is that the motion of the pulsar around the common barycenter of the system. And then the distance between us and uh, this uh, clock changes in time. And that means that the time of arrival of these regular pulses changes in a sort of sinusoidal or some elliptical uh, fashion, which we can uh, detect and uh, measure quite uh, easily. And these uh, neutron stars are used uh, uh, quite heavily also for uh, measuring effects of general relativity uh, and all sorts of uh, uh, very interesting and cool uh, things, even detecting uh, gravitational waves uh, uh, in the universe. But in this particular case, uh, in 1992, uh, Alex Wolschan and uh, his collaborator Dale Frail uh, actually uh, took a look at this particular pulsar, uh, PSR 1257 plus, plus 12, and noticed uh, that the pattern of the time of arrival of the signals from the system uh, actually looks uh, as if this system has uh, two planets with masses of about 3.4 Earth masses and 2.8 Earth masses. Later on, by doing even more careful observations, they discovered a planet with a mass of about a moon, which is sitting uh, even, closer, uh, even closer in. So it's remarkable, but the first exoplanets were detected about uh, effectively a stellar corpse, not about a real, uh, real uh, planet. And uh, somehow uh, we haven't been able to ex effectively repeat this, uh, repeat this um, uh, discovery because the number of these pulsar planets is extremely small. I mean, they, they, the authors say that uh, the non-negligible fraction of neutron stars uh, could have uh, planets, but we haven't seen this uh, uh, all that much uh, in the universe so far. Sure.
Uh, if you are considering just a pure gravitational dynamics, then no. Oh, I mean, it's a Hamiltonian, you know, Hamiltonian back, system. Back, yes, back, yes. Back from the, let's mm -hmm. say, all these years of computing, observing, and mm -hmm, yeah, I think it uh, pretty much is. At least we, it's difficult to identify forces uh, that might affect uh, them. I mean, uh, in long term, uh, many of the planets can be affected by dissipative forces. For example, the planets which are sitting close to their parent stars uh, experience tidal dissipation, tidal effects from the central star, and that can affect their orbital configurations in a non-Hamiltonian way. And I will mention this uh, later. When you talk uh, dissipation, you talk like tides. Yes, like yes, that. yes, that's right, that's right. Okay, good. So uh, the next uh, uh, next method uh, of uh, exoplanetary detection, which actually brought us a lot of uh, uh, exoplanets, is a so-called radial velocity method, and it's uh, actually very simple. So, in analogy with what we can do for the uh, pulsar planets, um, just imagine that you have a planet that orbits a central star, uh, and again, you know, even if the planet is uh, has very low mass, uh, the star will still be moving around uh, the common barycenter. I mean, it's not not going to be sitting in in one place. So that, that planetary motion will cause uh, the uh, sort of reflex motion of the star, which is, of course, much smaller in amplitude. Uh, but still, as, the, as uh, the star moves towards or away from us, just by measuring the usual Doppler effect uh, from the stellar, um, stellar absorption lines, for example, we can uh, pretty easily, in many cases, uh, measure uh, this displacement and figure out the presence of the planets around the stars. And the first discovery uh, of the star by, of the planet by this method uh, was done in 1995, for just three years after the pulsar planet discovery, by uh, Mayer and uh, uh, Kilo, uh, who uh, found this planet uh, 51 Peg B uh, with a period of about 4.2 days. The mass of the planet is about, uh, I forgot, I think it's 0.5 uh, Jupiter masses or so. So it's a giant planet sitting in an orbit uh, with a period of 4.2 days. Okay, so this is, you know, tiny, very compact orbit and uh, uh, just admitting uh, that a giant planet can be sitting in such an unusual configuration from the point of view of the solar system uh, required quite a bit of a courage from uh, Mayor and Kilos, uh, uh, but, you know, they have uh, really been now rewarded uh, by, you know, the fact that they are the first discoverers of the exoplanets around normal stars. You can see that the amplitude of the radial velocity signal in this case is pretty uh, large. It's about uh, 70 or you know, 50 uh, meters uh, per second. And the error bars on the individual measurement are quite uh, small. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is a radial velocity curve. It's basically sampling the orbit for many, 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 many years and then folding them in phase uh, on the same common period of 4.2 days. So that's what uh, we usually... It's basically this sinusoidal signature that tells us uh, that tells us that there is a. So we, we didn't really shoot light or send No, light. no, we don't it see the light. Only from the, the indirectly from the perturbation. Yes, yes, exactly. In in this sense, it's you know it's really just a perturbation of the planet on a star, really pure Keplerian perturbation. Yes. Uh, and uh, but by this. By me measuring the strength of this perturbation, this amplitude of the radial velocity signal, we actually can figure out the mass of the planet. Because the more massive is a planet, the stronger it displaces a star. So there is a direct uh, relation between uh, the measured radial velocity signal and the mass of the planet. So that allows us to weight uh, planets effectively. Another thing that we can do is we can look at the elongation uh, of the orbits of these planets because planets not necessarily, do not necessarily move in uh, circular orbits. Some of them move in circular orbits, some of them move in very elongated orbits. And when uh, the planets move on these uh, very eccentric uh, orbits, uh, when they move uh, close to the uh, periastron, close to the star, they move very quickly. When they move at apoastron, they uh, orbit uh, very slowly, and that changes uh, the um, signature, radial velocity signature. So, for example, this is a real planet and its radial velocity signature, uh, uh, and you see that for an eccentricity of 0.5, uh, the radial velocity signal does not look like a pure sinusoid. It's actually quite distorted. So by measuring this distortion, we can uh, figure out the eccentricity of the orbit. So not just the mass of the planet, but also the shape of its uh, orbit. And if uh, I summarize uh, our knowledge uh, obtained by this uh, method, by the, uh, by the Doppler uh, uh, searches, by the radial velocity searches, uh, it would look like this. Uh, this plot shows one of the pretty recent uh, compilations of uh, data showing the mass, masses of uh, planets 
majority of which are uh, obtained with this Doppler uh, technique. So different colors of the points uh, show the discovery, the method by which the planet was discovered. Uh, but most of the measurements of the mass uh, were obtained by then uh, finding actually the radial velocity signal uh, from these planets and you know, measuring its, uh, its uh, strengths. So this is how the uh, picture looks like and uh, uh, you can see that there is a whole variety of masses that we are, to which we are uh, sensitive at the moment. You know, the masses uh, here expressed in terms of the Earth mass uh, can span, you know, this is Jupiter, this is Saturn, so you can have masses from, you know, one Earth mass all the way up to, you know, um, I don't know, three Jupiter masses, uh, ten Jupiter masses, uh, and uh, so on. So we are sensitive to all kinds of uh, masses, although, of course, we lose sensitivity for small, uh, for small uh, planets. Do you have a feeling what's the smallest mass, what's the largest mass, like the size? Oh, uh, the largest mass for uh, what's called planet would be 13 Jupiter masses, because above that we would call this object a brown dwarf, because it can start burning deuterium in its uh, interiors, and planets, by definition, are not supposed to do that. Uh, the lowest masses, uh, no, I mean, presumably, you know, there would be asteroid belts and, you know, whether you call them planets or not, it's a big issue. Now, what's uh, also interesting about this uh, diagram that I showed is uh, looking at the horizontal scale of the diagram. And you can see, you can see that uh, planets, a lot of planets are sitting at a distance which is about uh, less than 10% of the distance between the Sun and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Earth. Then 51 Peg uh, is, uh, you know, the first discovery is one of such planets. This actually is a histogram, taking this data and actually plotting the histogram of the data. And again, you can see this huge peak. I mean, there is a lot of planets sitting very close to their star. Uh, very much unlike our own solar system, where Mercury sits at 0.04 AU, somewhere over here, and all the other planets are uh, outside. So uh, this actually, actually, this clump of points uh, are called uh, so-called hot Jupiters, because these are planets with a mass of Jupiter, and they sit very close to their parent star. The temperatures on their surfaces are uh, above uh, 1,000 Kelvin. I mean, they can be as high as 25,000 Kelvin in some uh, extreme cases, and that actually can do some damage to their uh, atmospheres. So the origin of these hot Jupiters is something that I hopefully uh, will be able to touch upon uh, later in my talk, but this is definitely something that you know, we don't have in our own solar system. Okay, yes? Right. Right. Massive. Yes, massive closing guys. Yes, uh, this is what we call observational biases in astrophysics. In astrophysics, that's uh, absolutely correct. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, to see the radial velocity signal from the planet, you have to see a whole orbit. Uh, given that we have only 20-year time span for our Doppler uh, observations, that means that we are not sensitive to planets beyond uh, 10 astronomical units, and that's why we don't have uh, much of the objects over here. So, you are perfectly, uh, perfectly uh, correct, but. We are getting uh, definitely to completeness out of the separations of well, one AU, and uh, we still see that there is, you know, this uh, overabundance of planets very close to the parent star. Okay, now talking about eccentricities. Uh, so this uh, this is a somewhat complicated uh, plot, but just let's just focus on the left uh, panel, which shows the eccentricity of the planets uh, as a function of the uh, of their period. Uh, these are the planets detected uh, with, you know, the Doppler planets measured with radial velocity surveys. Uh, the colors of uh, and colors and shapes of points uh, don't matter. I mean, these are just single planets, multiple planets, and so on. What's important is that the eccentricities of these guys can be very, very high. So eccentricities of planets in our own solar system are very low. They are uh, at the level of several percent. While for exoplanets, they can be as high as uh, 95%. And actually, uh, a lot of exoplanets have very high uh, eccentricities. So this right panel actually shows the eccentricity di distribution for the binary stars that we observe, you know, in our galaxy. And it looks like, you know, the distribution of eccentricities of the binaries is actually not so much different from the eccentricity distribution of planets. So that's uh, an interesting puzzle that we are trying to address and trying to understand what's causing this uh, uh, you know, bizarre eccentricity distribution and why it's uh, so similar to the binary stars. But coming back to your questions about dissipation, you will notice that there are not many planets in this corner of the phase space. That's precisely because these planets with uh, high eccentricities uh, would come very close to the parent star. 
And they will not burn, no, but the tidal dissipation will very quickly uh, destroy their eccentricity and bring them to uh, circular orbits. So it would circularize them. That's why there is this overabundance of planets uh, over here. So that's, uh, that's a clear signature of tidal dissipation. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, if in, in, a, in a dissipative system, yes. That, that, that's, that's kind of the end state in this case. Yeah, wouldn't that also indicate the migration of bigger Oh, you mean, uh, you mean this thing? Eccentricity. You mean this thing, or what? Well, that, that too. That and the higher eccentricity. Higher eccentricity in what, uh, in what well, way? Well, it doesn't have to. It might migrate on a circular orbit if uh, there is some coupling to external perturbation. I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, maybe it will become clearer. I have to listen. Okay, okay. Uh, right, okay. So uh, one of the recent, you know, very exciting highlights uh, that we uh, got from this radial velocity technique is the discovery of planet uh, around our closest stellar neighbor, Proxima Centauri, which is uh, located at, at about four, uh, four uh, light years uh, away from us. It's a, small, uh, it's a small star, its luminosity is just, you know, 0.15% of the solar, uh, small radius, small mass. Um, but it's the closest uh, thing that we have uh, uh, to us. And uh, uh, this chart shows uh, the data that we have obtained over uh, more than 20 years of observing this uh, system. So the planet has a period of 11 days, but the data spent 20 years. And you, as you can see, there are many, many, many data points, and this is what you need to detect a signal of a very low mass planet with a mass of just 1.3 Earth masses. Uh, because then the signal uh, is at the level of you know, one or two meters per second, and this is still very difficult for us uh, to detect. So you need to uh, accumulate a lot of observations to be able to you know, draw this sinusoidal curve that represents the radial velocity signal of the planet. And that planet actually turns out uh, to have a temperature at its surface that puts it right in the, what we call a habitable zone. Habitable zone is a region, uh, you know, away from the star, uh, at the inner edge of which uh, the water would be in, you know, would turn into vapor. You would have a hundred uh, uh, centigrade temperature on the surface. Uh, on the outer edge, you would have uh, the water freezing, turning into the ice, so it would be zero centigrade uh, on the surface. So you can define this uh, particular zone where the water can exist in liquid form, and people think that this should be favorable for life. So finally, uh, Proxima b, this uh, planet, also lies in its uh, habitable zone of its planet. But even despite the fact that its uh, period is 11 days, that's because the planet, the star is so faint uh, that to have such uh, you know, temperature of about 300 Kelvin, you actually need to sit in this 11 day uh, orbit. And so this planet potentially can have liquid water and in principle might maintain conditions uh, for life. So that's a really is cool. Mars is inside? It's not in, no, it's not in. But you know, the conditions on the surface are such that under certain circumstances, the water can exist on its surface. So it's, it's just skimming uh, its, uh, its outer edge. Okay, uh, another uh, method which is actually very uh, productive uh, has been uh, the method of the so-called planetary transits. So in planetary transits, what you see is uh, basically uh, some version of the kind of solar eclipse. So in solar eclipse, we see moon uh, that moves in front of the sun and closes uh, the sun uh, completely, as in this case. That's because we are sitting close to the moon and uh, the angular diameter of the moon is the same as the angular diameter of the sun, so the moon can cover the sun completely. If we were observing uh, uh, this uh, uh, you know, crossing of the moon over the surface of the disk of the sun uh, from very large distance, we would see, of course, that the dimming of light is much smaller. It's just basically the surface area of the moon divided by the surface area of the sun, which is a very small uh, number. Uh, and this uh, small movie just shows the idea of the planetary transit. Uh, here, what is the black dot is the Jupiter-like planet, which is uh, 10 times smaller than the size of the star. And uh, this uh, scale shows you the flux, flux coming from the uh, star that we are detecting. So if I run this movie, you see that at some point uh, the flux drops because the planet goes over the disk of the star uh, and it actually blocks out some light and that's why we see this uh, transit which lasts typically for several uh, hours depending on the orbit of the planet. So that's uh, the whole idea of the uh, planetary transit. 
Now, transits uh, give us information about the size of the planet. They don't necessarily tell us anything about the mass of the planet, but they can, if we know the, si the size of the star, then we know the size of the planet. Because, you know, you just measure this uh, relative amount of dimming of light, and that's it, you've got the radius of the planet. Uh, so for Jupiter, this uh, drop is about 1%, as in this case. For Earth, which is 10 times smaller than Jupiter, uh, you square it uh, uh, and you get uh, uh, something on the order of 10 to the minus uh, 4. But uh, it's interesting uh, that, uh, you know, these things are still uh, detectable with very uh, cheap technology, with very simple uh, technology. So, for example, uh, transits produced by Jupiter can be detected uh, even from the ground. The only thing is you need continuous monitoring. You uh, ideally would like to watch many, many stars continuously uh, to see these you know, uh, rare uh, transits lasting for several uh, hours. And uh, my colleagues, you know, my colleague at uh, Princeton, uh, Gaspar Bakos, has built this network of robotic telescopes, which are sitting uh, in um, uh, Chile, in uh, Australia, in uh, South Africa, and are fully operated. I mean, he operates them basically from his office in uh, Princeton. Uh, so I'll show you a brief movie as to how this uh, happens. This shows the uh, illuminated part of the southern uh, hemisphere and the changes. It's all happening in real time, all three uh, locations. So, so. Cheap interruption, you said two words. Sorry? Cheap and robotic. Yes. So this, this project would cost probably, I mean, definitely less than $1 million. So it's uh, at the level of several hundred K. You basically can buy all the telescopes just in any uh, you know, store that sells uh, uh, telescopes. You design your you know, robotic system that will uh, operate them. You transmit all the data through internet, and that's it. So okay. with a million dollars, you're trying to tell us yeah. we can go on uh, up, up here in the yeah. room. Yeah. Yeah. And you from Cambridge, you have an yeah. army of students yeah. here in Kazakhstan yeah. observing exoplanets, writing papers. Yes, yes. This, is, this has been done in astrophysics for already 10 years. Not, not just for exoplanets, but also for observing so-called GRBs, supernova explosions. And, uh, you know, there are many robotic facilities sitting all over the world and doing these kind of things. Uh, so I need to continue the question. I'm very sorry. I, you know, this is what you're telling us is something very exciting. Yeah, it is. No, no, I know. So you're telling me. So let me let me just start the movie so that you know ah, we can we can okay. we can talk we can talk while it uh, runs. So, uh, you know, this is uh, the rotation of the Earth, uh, and this is what happens at each location. See, I mean, they open themselves, they follow the light. If there are clouds or rain, they close. Uh, you know, they have uh, the weather uh, kind of sensors and so on, and that just you know goes on and on and on continuously. So, so if a graduate student mm -hmm. is here in Kazakhstan and finds a new planet. He has it. No. <laughs> he owns it. No, 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 he owns it. Yeah, he, 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 he can give you its name and all that uh -huh. stuff. What's going to happen to his career after that? Oh, I mean, well, right now these planets are being discovered in dozens. Right. So this particular project has already discovered close to 100 uh, planets uh, yeah, on its own. We get 101. The next one. What's going to happen to the career of that particular individual? Well, I mean, he will definitely be very well trained in, you know, this uh, field of exoplanets. So, and we will uh, know quite uh, a lot about... Uh, What's going to happen in his career? He gets a dumb PhD from Azerbaijan University. What does it happen to him? Well, I mean, he will have an item on his CV saying that he discovered a planet. Just will hire him at Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. We have, we have a lot of people actually doing this kind of, you know, Doppler observations, you transits, and so on. Okay, good. Um, now, um, despite this, uh, you know, beauty of this uh, technique and, you know, that you can do tabletop experiments, uh, the very serious things uh, should actually be done from space because space, in space you can have much more stable conditions which let you measure uh, things not at the level of 1% but actually 10 to the minus 3 of a percent, so 10 to the minus 5 uh, changes in the photometry. And this has been beautifully accomplished by the uh, Kepler mission, which is a half billion dollar uh, mission launched by NASA in 2009, uh, which has given us, uh, you know, tremendous view on uh, the exoplanetary systems. First of all, it discovered more than 5,000 uh, potential uh, planets that we are now uh, uh, busily verifying, you know, whether these are real systems or not, by basically trying to find their Doppler signature, this radial, trying to find this radial velocity signal. 
because uh, you know we uh, this uh, method, as I said, you know gives us the sizes. Uh, we also want to know uh, the masses, and it's high sensitivity. You know the photometry, the level of ten to the minus five, allows us to detect objects with the size of of an Earth, effectively. Uh, so what are the things that we have learned? Okay, first uh, puzzles uh, that sort of jump right at you are the physical properties of planets. So this distribution of sizes uh, of uh, Kepler planets versus the orbital separation uh, kind of tell you that, uh, again, we are seeing something that we don't have in our own solar system. So all of these, uh, all of these guys are sitting within one AU uh, because the uh, period is less than 365 days and all the stars are roughly, you know, uh, not too far different in their mass from the, uh, from the Sun. You can see that initially in 2010 and 2011, uh, it was mainly the big planets that were discovered by Kepler because their signal is much stronger. But then it you know, progressed towards smaller and smaller objects and actually discovered a lot of uh, the so-called hot Neptunes and uh, super-Earths. Objects which are bigger than the Earth and uh, less in size than, let's say, Saturn, and which sit very close to the parent star. Again, in our own solar system, we don't have an analog of such uh, planets, and this, is, uh, this has been an interesting uh, discovery. Uh, right now, we know that most of, the, uh, most of the exoplanetary systems are in such configurations. They have, you know, these super-Earths and uh, Neptunes uh, sitting very close to the parent stars. So, each solar system has some kind of signal? Yeah, the, actually, the frequency... They are similar? Uh, solar systems are kind of similar? What do you mean, solar systems? Other systems. Uh, many of them are similar to each other. Yeah, they would have this, you know, super Earth or Neptune sitting so close it's to the star. Really, the one over R square into this jump. It's really, it's really the Newton's law that tells us. To ah, some extent, extent, yes, 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 right. Now, if you have a measurement of the uh, uh, planetary size from transit, and then you also get a radial velocity signal from it, uh, you know, by observing it, by taking spectrum with a big telescope and so on, then you can actually measure the density of planet. I mean, if you, you can plot, uh, put planet on this, you know, mass radius uh, diagram, um, and then you can try to figure out what the planet is made of. Because we know that for a given mass, you know, a particular composition, for example, water predicts a certain uh, uh, radius, uh, and, you know, for hydrogen uh, objects such as, you know, Jupiter, for example, you expect this, uh, this particular uh, mass radius uh, relation and certain uh, density for each particular mass. So now we are able to do this uh, even for uh, low mass planets. So this is for planetary radii of, you know, four or five Earth's masses and so on. And, uh, uh, you know, different compositions can be drawn uh, on uh, such diagrams. So, for example, you know, Earth-like composition, uh, composition in which you have 5% atmosphere, you know, by mass, 5% of hydrogen helium on top, or maybe a planet made out of uh, pure water, 100% of water. Uh, you can also see that there is a lot of degeneracies. You know, some of the planets can be fed by being a pure water, or uh, you know, Earth-like uh, core with 5% by mass of an hydrogen helium atmosphere. So uh, it really uh, made the, the game much more uh, interesting, much more uh, information content rich but also much more uh, complicated because now we have this uh, multiple uh, degeneracies in the game. Uh, well, next cool thing is uh, the discovery that actually many planets are sitting in very complicated uh, multiple systems. So that many stars actually contain not one, but several planets. And we see all of them doing uh, their own transits, basically. We see all of them crossing the disk of the, of the star. So this cool movie uh, has been compiled by Dan Fabrici and shows uh, uh, the sort of uh, real-time motion of these uh, multiple systems uh, uh, put together on a common, oops, on a common uh, scale. So all of them are normalized. You know, the sizes of the dots are showing you the sizes of the planets. Uh, you know, their orbits are scale, uh, scaled to the same uh, size. And, you know, some systems have two planets. Some have uh, three planets. Some have four. Some have five. And so on and so forth. So it's a real mess. OK, uh, and if I would try to make such a diagram right now, it would be like completely incomprehensible because uh, you would have, you know, many, 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 many more, more systems in this diagram. Some of them having, you know, six planets. OK, so it's really uh, cool. You can really see Kepler's laws. You know, the planets which are moving close to the star move much faster. Uh, you know, some systems have very closely separated planets and some the separation is pretty large. So it's a whole zoo of multiple uh, systems that we have been revealed with uh, Kepler. Well, uh, can we ask another question? 
Yes. We're moving in the modern domain of civilization. So uh, how do we name these planets, number one? Uh, they're, they're named, uh, well, uh, no, they're named Kepl Kepler uh, and number. So initially they're named KOI, Kepler Object of Interest, because this is still a candidate. And then if it's verified that it's a real planet by, for example, detecting radial velocity signature, then uh, you name it Kepler 75, Kepler 57. So from the point of view of the American frontier, if I need to sell the planet because I found it, mm -hmm. is there any way to claim ownership of that real estate? No. Nah. <laughs> well, no, it's a serious question. It's a serious question. No laugh. No, no laugh. It's an extremely important question. So all the celestial bodies are governed by the International Astronomical Union. Correct, correct. Yeah. So that, that has a whole power of, you know, selling that. or so doing so anything. Honestly, and I mean, I mean literally, if mm -hmm. I want to own mm -hmm. one of these planets, mm -hmm. the same way that I own land in the Philippines, mm -hmm. the same way that the same way that I own land, for example, close to the I don't know. You, you, you have to look into the international treaties that exist between all the countries on Earth and see what they say about this. Excuse me? It's not a matter of inhabitants, it's not a matter of inhabitants. I mean, the, the, this territory is as important as it was like 150 years ago going in the West. So do, you, do you have a piece of land on the moon? Yes, I do. But I'm try, so I'm, I, I'm trying to understand you know, the modern world from the point of view of ownership of land yes. that we understand here on, uh, on Earth. So you have a school of uh, public policy here, right? So you should ask people who study yeah, in this uh, school. They will, they will, they will educate us on what uh, should happen here. Oh no, 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 no! I don't want to go into this uh, frontier. I mean, this is for Donald Trump, really. Okay, now uh, let me ask you. Let, let me do a small. Uh, let me do a small uh, quiz. Who uh, knows where this picture come from? Star Wars. Star Wars. Yes. Cool. Uh, what is on this picture, actually? Two suns, yes, exactly. So this is a planet Tatooine where uh, Luke Skywalker was raised. Uh, and uh, this is a planet that orbits uh, a central binary star. So in the center you have a binary star which is orbited by, uh, by a planet. And the cool thing is that Kepler uh, have uh, found uh, such planets. You know, I like to joke that the first discovery of the circumbinary planets was actually by George Lucas in 1977 when the movie came up and you know apparently this is done by direct imaging I mean you can see really the two suns uh, but uh, jokes aside I mean Kepler has found about a dozen of such systems when by observing the eclipsing binaries uh, here you can see the signal photometric signal this light curve you know these dips these deep dips by 40 percent this is just when one of the star comes in front or behind another one and you have these big dips but then on top of that, you can see very tiny dips, you know, at the level of 0.1% produced by a planet that crosses disks of both uh, stars. This is a very complicated discovery. I mean, all of the orbits have to be aligned, of course, line in, in the same plane, be aligned with our line of sight and so on. Um, but, you know, these are sort of present representations of several such systems when there is, this is a central binary, this is a... Um, uh, orbit of the planet and if you you know cut out this central section expand it and you know turn it edge on this is how the uh, transit happens basically these are the disks of two stars this is their orbit and this is how planet crosses uh, crosses them so we now know uh, about 12 or 13 uh, such systems one of them has uh, three planets uh, so it's a really cool zoo a lot of exotic uh, systems and all of that uh, thanks uh, thanks to Kepler These binaries, uh, well, typically these are not very massive uh, stars. I mean, the typical masses are like, you know, half solar, half solar. No, 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 no. These are normal stars. All of these guys are normal stars, yes. They have orbits with uh, periods of about between 7 to 25 days, maybe, the stars themselves. And quite often these orbits are uh, relatively eccentric, so they can have uh, quite high eccentricities. And that, of course, induces strong dynamical perturbations on the orbits of the planets and actually complicates uh, even the whole planet formation uh, process. Okay, uh, one final method of exoplanets, but not the last one which I'll talk about, uh, is uh, the method of direct uh, detection. This is a method where you actually really see the light produced by the planet. But this is a very, very difficult exercise for a very simple reason. Uh, planets are very faint. 
Okay, if you put um, Earth uh, at 1 AU from the Sun where it's uh, now and you compare the light produced by the Earth, which is basically all, all of it is just a reflected light, lighted by the Sun, reflected by the Earth, compared to the luminosity of the Sun, the ratio would be close to 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so this by itself is like uh, trying to see a firefly next to a huge uh, lighthouse, which is very, very difficult. The lighthouse will just swamp the light. But even uh, more, uh, even worse, uh, uh, we are observing these systems from very large distances. Uh, so there is, a, uh, you know, and uh, all telescopes have a finite uh, resolution. So the diffraction limit of a telescope is, of course, as you all know, I'm sure, is uh, lambda divided by d, the diameter of the telescope. For 10 meter telescope, it theoretically is uh, about 0.02 arc seconds. Uh, which is a small uh, number. Uh, however, uh, we live on a planet with an atmosphere. An atmosphere uh, has turbulence in it, and that turbulence produces blurring of the signal uh, of the star. So, for example, if we, uh, if this is a signal, uh, you know, that a telescope, big telescope, would see at the diffraction limit, uh, by introducing atmosphere, we see this, you know, big fuzzy blob of light. And of course, if the planet is sitting somewhere over here, then this big fuzzy blob of light with an intensity of, you know, 10 to the times, 10 to the tens uh, times stronger, will just swamp the signal of the planet completely. So, but people are uh, smart and clever and they designed the technique of the so-called adaptive uh, optics. So what this adaptive optics does, and yeah, I'm sure that many of you know what uh, this is. Uh, uh, what it does, it basically takes some part of light that has been emitted by the star and passed uh, through an atmosphere. Now, this light is, of course, not just a pure plane wave that comes from the star. It was distorted by the turbulence in the atmosphere. So it, the wavefront is distorted. By taking this small amount of light, uh, you put it through a special uh, sensors, which actually measure this distortion of light at every pixel uh, in, your, uh, in your, effectively, CCD, the element that reads out uh, the signal, that effectively reads out the signature, the, the, uh, well, the image. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you run this uh, through the computer, uh, you do this sensing very frequently, you know, tens of thousands of times per second. You run this whole machinery through the computer and you uh, calculate the signal which you then apply to your mirror. So your mirror of the telescope has uh, hundreds or even thousands of the so-called actuators, small uh, piezo elements that can, you know, to which you can apply electric signals and deform uh, these elements uh, slightly. So the shape of the mirror now becomes deformed in such a way to compensate for the distortions of light produced by the atmosphere. And ideally, you would uh, be able to completely compensate for these uh, atmospheric uh, distortions. So this is what is done in this figure. This is, you know, uh, what you observe directly, direct signal coming from the atmosphere. This is uh, by applying this uh, adaptive optics. And you see that you shrunk uh, the uh, size of this diffraction, uh, diffraction pattern to a much uh, smaller uh, thing. So this, these things illustrate the performance of the adaptive optics. I mean, how good we can do this. So this is an image of uh, Uranus uh, done from the ground. Uh, you can see that without adaptive optics, you know, these are two different wavelengths. Uh, without adaptive optics, we cannot clearly see the rings of Uranus. We cannot clearly see these uh, clouds. But by applying the adaptive optics, we, you know, really get the ability to see these very, very fine details, which otherwise get totally blurred. This uh, is a different system. This is a center of our galaxy where there is a supermassive black hole with a mass of 4 million solar masses uh, sitting. And the stars uh, move uh, uh, significantly uh, rapidly around this black hole that, you know, some of them have orbits uh, with periods of about 30 years. So we have been following uh, these uh, stars with uh, big telescopes. And if you do this without adaptive optics, you just see this, you know, blob of light in the center of uh, the galaxy around the black hole. By applying the adaptive optics, we actually start seeing individual stars and we can do astrometry on their motion, uh, sort of Keplerian motion around the central black hole. So adaptive optics is, has really become a key uh, player in uh, modern uh, astrophysics and that's really, really uh, big uh, uh, sort of uh, investment. Yeah. Yes, yes. And a sensor. It's a and sensor. And a, and a sensor. Yeah. Uh, well, there was initial huge dollar uh, amount, uh, you know, in actually coming up with this uh, technique. First of all, it, uh, of course, had a military origin yes. uh, to look down, yeah. not up. 
then uh, I guess, you know, uh, it actually is, all of it uh, is uh, quite uh, expensive. I mean, first you need to sensors to be quite, you know, this is a complicated technique. You have a number of these small lenses, you know, it's like a big focal plane is, gets all covered with lenses and you design a system which senses these uh, distortions. You know, they're putting actuators on the mirror is also not a trivial uh, task. And then you have the, you know, to run, uh, to have a pipeline, com computer pipeline. Where, is, where are the two kind of telescopes, the, the two adaptive optics telescopes with non-military applications that they have, that they are the most powerful? At this oh, uh, it's KEC uh, yeah. and very large uh, telescope, European one in, uh, in Chile. So these are the biggest ones. But you know, effectively all of them, like Subaru telescope has adaptive optics, uh, Gemini telescope has adaptive optics, uh, all of them. Now, uh, again, coming back to you know, detecting planets, uh, the fact that you concentrated all this light uh, uh, of the star in a smaller region uh, still does not help you to see planet because you know, it's still, you know, the contrast ratio is enormous. So what you do next is you actually put a mask uh, in a focal plane of the telescope to basically physically kill this light. And then you get something like this. So now you can actually see small fine details that, you know, present in this image. But even that is not enough. You actually do some very complicated post-processing uh, at a software level, which I'm not going to go into the details of. But in the end, what you find is you actually see planets. Like uh, you see this uh, blob of light. This is actually a planet. Uh, around the star Beta uh, Pictoris B that we are able to see only after this complicated set of uh, highly technological steps have been uh, performed uh, on the observation. So it's a really, the field is really loaded with uh, technology. I mean, this, um, this adaptive optics, this uh, direct detections. I'm actually part of one of the uh, projects uh, that are doing uh, uh, direct, uh, direct detections, you know, imaging uh, of, uh, you know, planetary systems. Uh, it's uh, put on an 8 meter telescope in uh, Chile again, on the Gemini South telescope. Uh, Gemini Planet Imager, GPI, uh, is a big instrument, you know, very thermally well controlled, sits uh, on the back of the telescope. And what it does, it, you know, it achieves contrast ratios of 10 to the 6, so 1 millionth, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, in the 1 or 2 hour observations. I previously mentioned to you that uh, uh, the Earth would have a contrast of about 10 to the minus 10 at 1 AU, right? So here I'm talking about 10 to the 6. This is much, well, much sort of larger, much smaller contrast. What can we see with this contrast? Clearly not the Earth, not Earth-like planets, but it turns out that when the planets are still young, you know, if the planet is, is a giant planet like a Jupiter, and when it's young, when it's uh, less than 100 million years uh, uh, old, then the planets are still actually very hot from formation. When you put together this big blob of gas, it contains a lot of uh, thermal energy, and this energy passively uh, cools off. And so what we see is actually a pretty bright source of light. Okay, so we know, I mean, for example, our own giant planets also still lose some amount of uh, heat from, you know, 4.5 billion years uh, since uh, they have formed. And the same uh, idea applies uh, here. You just see the light, uh, you know, this uh, passive cooling of the planet, but this can actually be uh, so bright that contrast ratio of 10 to the 6 uh, allows you to see this uh, signal. So in 2015, just uh, about a year ago, we actually discovered our first planet uh, around the star 51 uh, Eridani B, uh, which is uh, this particular, this is three different uh, wavelengths, but you know, the stellar signal is here. And you can see that this instrument is very well, is very good at suppressing uh, the light of, uh, light of the central uh, star. It's actually a very complicated facility because it uh, not only does all these steps which I mentioned, it also measures spectrum uh, at each pixel uh, in the image. And it also does this in the polarized, uh, uh, in the polarized uh, light. So we immediately get the spectrum of uh, uh, the planet. Uh, we figured out uh, in, in this near infrared uh, wavelengths, we figured out that the, that the planet has a lot of methane in its atmosphere uh, because it, we see these methane absorption bands. Uh, and so that makes this planet quite similar to Jupiter uh, in some uh, sense, in terms of structure of its atmosphere. It's uh, not very massive. It has a mass of about two Jupiter masses. It sits uh, pretty close to its uh, star. Uh, but so this technique actually gives, lets us uh, see the emission of light uh, of the planet uh, itself. 
And you know other other important discoveries are, for example, again this Beta Peak uh, B, uh, you know, ten Jupiter mass planet uh, in a ten uh, Earth AU orbit around a very young star with an with age of about twenty million years. This star also has a big uh, uh, disk of uh, so-called debris. It's basically a dust dust which is heated by the light of the star, and we see this scattered light and its uh, thermal uh, emission. So the potential for this technique is uh, very very uh, large. Um, I will have to skip quite a bit of uh, useful information about formation of planets, but if you're interested, please feel free to stop at my uh, office and uh, 205, 7205 and uh, talk to me. I just wanted to conclude by, mention, by saying that uh, these are not all of the methods by which we are measuring planets. We can actually use general relativity to detect planets, and we do this by uh, detect finding them via the so-called microlensing technique. Uh, we can detect them by seeing the displacement in the plane of the sky using the astrometry and the recent uh, launch of the satellite, European satellite Gaia, will help us detect hundreds of planets by this uh, method. But somewhat uh, more in the future, uh, these are sort of the facilities to look uh, uh, towards uh, in the future. So uh, ALMA is a very beautiful facility that allows us to see the early stages of planet formation. It allows us to study protoplanetary disks. It operates uh, in a submillimeter at submillimeter wavelengths. This is right now the uh, most expensive uh, uh, ground-based uh, telescope. It uh, cost 1.6 billion dollars to construct it in Chile. It's like 66 big uh, 20 meter antennae that can move uh, completely over the distance of 15 kilometers in any arrangement. Who paid that bill? Sorry? Who paid that bill? It's international collaboration, so it's all over the world. It's ESA, you know, NASA, well, uh, NSF, and uh, uh, so on. Uh, because uh, because uh, it has very dry climate, so it, it's built at a height of uh, four or five thousand meters. Uh, sub sub millimeter uh, in sub millimeter band, you have a lot of water absorption, so you need very dry uh, climate. The same thing applies for the near infrared. That's why many observatories that can observe in near infrared sit in Chile at uh, mountain tops, including the Gemini South. Uh, so TESS uh, is a mission that will uh, find uh, more planets uh, by direct imaging starting next year. Uh, somewhat more in the future, European Plato will uh, do even better job at uh, this. And then we can characterize planets. I mean, once we discover them, we can actually start uh, studying their atmospheres. And uh, in doing this, uh, the JWST, James Webb Telescope, uh, supposed to be launched in 2018, which is like the most expensive telescope <laughs> of all times, $8 billion, uh, will actually be completely uh, indispensable. So uh, hope, I hope this provides you uh, with a sort of outlook into the future. You can see that there is a lot of interest, uh, a lot of huge potential for the discovery, uh, huge money flows uh, uh, going in this uh, direction, many space missions, many ground-based uh, projects. So the potential for future development, including the Kazakhstan soil, is really good. So I hope to see you know, some uh, Kazakh names on the papers to come out in the future announcing discovering of discoveries of exoplanets. And uh, thank you very much. This is my summary. <clears throat> <coughs> We have time for a couple more questions. So given that not all exoplanets are easily discoverable, what, how many stars are believed to have planets? Okay, so that's kind of a statistical question which we are now able to more or less answer with uh, the Kepler discoveries because we, as I said, you know, have uh, thousands of uh, planets. Uh, for each, uh, for each uh, system, we know the, roughly the probability at which a uh, planet can transit its parent star because you, know, you assume that all the orbits are randomly distributed. So then you count how many out of you know, the observed number of stars uh, you found uh, to have a planet and you just divide by this probability and get the rate. So the current estimates is, that is uh, at least 50% of the uh, stars should have planets around them. But m most likely this number will uh, go up to close to 100%. I mean, it depends on also the size of the planet, right? Uh, if you're willing to tolerate moon as a planetary object, you know, if it's uh, one moon uh, moving around the star, well, then maybe that's a planetary system too, which we will have very hard time uh, detecting. Yes. So, okay, so that's, that's a very good question. So the way you do this is you need, first of all, a planet that's transiting. So it comes over the surface of the star. When it happens, uh, some light of the star will be 
passing through the outer limb, through the atmosphere of the planet. It's, you know, very thin shell uh, on the surface of the planet where you can actually have the light of the star pass through and still make it through. It will be slightly absorbed. If you have oxygen uh, or carbon in the atmosphere of the planet, it will preferentially absorb this, uh, this, uh, this emission. And given the size of the limb, which is tiny, I mean, it's a small uh, compared to the size of the star, it's a very difficult measurement to make. But people now are able to make such measurements and they are actually building, uh, you know, the spectra of the exoplanetary atmospheres in transmission. This is a called transmission spectroscopy, this technique. Uh, and it's a beautiful technique and it tells us a lot about uh, what's, uh, what is the composition of the outer layers. Oh, it's not transiting. It's not transiting. It's just a radial velocity signal. So it's not passing through o over the disk of the star, unfortunately. But uh, for many, uh, for like several dozens of planets, we have been able to do this. this these usually are giant uh, planets. And that's, you know, that's a really uh, cool, cool method for studying atmospheres. Yes. Sir, I'm going to graduate from this physics department this year. I'm 21 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. When I graduate from that graduate school, I want to be a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies for the next two years at Princeton. It's minimum, f minimum four years these days. Excellent. Please give me mm -hmm. the names of the three groups in the planet mm -hmm. that I can do my PhD and take me straight to Princeton. Well, so right now it's not three, it's many, many more. I mean, no, no, no. effectively give all. Me three. Give me okay, three that okay. Guarantee me the position okay. after that. That okay, okay, okay. Give me the three. No okay, okay. Berkeley, Princeton, the Harvard. Names of the the names oh, of the, the names of the faculty. Yes. Well, I mean, okay, I'll, th th this is going to be the long list because there are no, many no, people doing it. Okay, well, Hidro Knudsen, Gaspar Bakos, uh, Dave Charbonneau, uh, so three faculty who are doing this. Okay, so, so Berkeley? Yes, it's uh, Berkeley, uh, Princeton, uh, Harvard, you know, Caltech, obviously, Santa Cruz, all of these, you know, places, uh, University of California places, you know, Santa Barbara and so on. Barbara. Yeah, oh, uh, every, everyone who has access to CAC uh, telescope okay, so will be in this. Also people in Arizona. In Arizona, there is a big group. University of Arizona has a huge group of working on exoplanets and, you know, many other places too. I mean, in Europe, I'm not even mentioning Europe. That's so, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Let's save, so uh, for let, let's let's uh, well let the uh, younger generation ask uh, one last question. Uh, you said that uh, on the instrument on Gemini. Yes. We have a uh, polarimeter. Yes. Uh, what kind of polarization you Okay, so that's a again very very good question. Uh, so polarization, um, uh, as you probably know, polarization. Uh, so the star is non-polarized because you know it produces light of the stars produces all kinds of polarization. They cancel out. You get non-polarized light. Uh, if you get polarization, if you scatter uh, this unpolarized light off something, if you have a surface that scatters, you immediately get polarized uh, signal. That's not good for these planets because these planets are emitting their own light. It's also unpolarized. But it's actually good for studying uh, uh, these systems, which are uh, protoplanetary disks. Protoplanetary disks are called big collections of dust uh, and uh, uh, gas. Uh, so dust is just 1% by mass in these disks, but it actually is the agent that uh, intercepts stellar light and scatters it off. So when we are observing these disks, uh, another additional way to suppress the stellar light is to observe in polarized uh, light. Then we see the signal, scattered signal uh, of, the, you know, of the disk uh, and don't see the signal of the star because it's unpolarized. So in this way, the polarization, having polarization cap capability is really, really cool uh, for observing uh, protoplanetary disks and uh, debris disks. So this is why we need the polarization on this instrument. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, have an electrical star, mm -hmm. you can have polarization like you can measure the circle of stars, then you can see the magnetic structure. True. This, this yes. Yes, but you are actually, I mean, you are blocking, you are trying to kill the light of the central. Hmm? Uh, but really, to see the stars, the stars. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes pe people actually uh, do this. I mean, uh, so, uh, well, th th pe people, people actually try to do this um, uh, without relation to the planet. They just observe uh, young stars with strong magnetic fields, and they do exactly this thing. They measure polarization signal. 
No, 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 not with this instrument. This instrument, you know, is a very narrowly focused on, you know, finding planets and looking at uh, protoplanetary disks. So here you're trying to totally kill the signal. Uh, you know, the star is somewhere in the very, very, very center. So any polarization coming from the star is going to be killed here. So you only see uh, the polarization coming from a separate, I mean, this, this, this scales are about 100 AU. Okay, 100 times bigger than the distance between the sun and the earth. So, and you see a lot of structure. I mean, you see the spiral arms, you see this uh, rings and disks and so on. So it's really, really cool. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I think it's time to say thank you for the following. Continue. <laughs>